Hi everyone, and thanks a lot to Paul Bryan from UXTrack to invite me to talk about innovation in times of uncertainty. And in this session we will focus on, as the title already says, uncertain times as a driver of innovation. But let me tell you a bit more about myself. So my name is Remco van Mulen and I'm the VP of Product Innovation at Coa Health. And from background, I'm a designer. I studied innovation management and product design engineering at Delft University, and further on studied psychology at Leiden University to understand perception, changing organizations, and how design can have an impact on people. And during the past 20 years, I had the honor to work with some great companies on very innovative projects like Warner Brothers, Financial Times, Ballpaper, Telefonica O2, and Electrolux. And as you don't innovate alone, um, I had the luck to set up collaborations and work with great teams from Harvard Medical School, the Royal College of Art, Imperial College, London School of Economics. But let me tell you a bit more about COA Health. So, the mission of COA Health is to create simple, personal and accessible mental health support. And when I started the project, which later turned into COA Health in 2013, I found that the taboo and care in mental health could use some improvement. Most people didn't get access to mental health care, didn't know they had a mental health issue at all, and when they got access, it was mostly in the form of a face-to-face -face visit, and the benefits of mobile and personalized care were only at the start of being explored. So access and awareness was, and is, a huge issue. And just to show you how big of an issue mental health really is, let me share you some high-level stats. So 25% of people, and this is before COVID, experience a mental health issue during their life. So imagine that. Of your four colleagues of, or friends, one will have depression or anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder or any kind of mental health disease during their life. One of these episodes, one in four. And let's now jump into some of the specific conditions. So as mentioned before, before COVID, 8.1% of people had anxiety. And that's the prevalence. So that means that at this moment, 8.1% of the population is suffering from anxiety. Not an anxiety attack, but anxiety in general and 6.5% of depression. But now let's go back to June 2020 in the height of the epidemic and see what happened there. So here it boosts up, like anxiety went up from 8.1%, which is already quite a lot, to a staggering 25.5%. And depression went up from 6.5% to 24.3%. So one in four of your colleagues or friends currently has anxiety, or at least in June, and another one has depression. See the massive impact that it has on people's life. Now, and when anxiety and depression get too much to bear for people, people start thinking of ending it all. Now, before the crisis, this was already 4.3%. Now, after the crisis, it went up to 2.7%. One in 10 people been thinking about ending it all. Well, happily, between brackets, I mean, between quotes, most people don't really act upon their thoughts, or at least don't succeed upon their thoughts of, of ending it all. But unfortunately, around 100,000 people between the US and Europe do end their life on a yearly basis. That means that every day, each and every day, one of these plates full of people. So here we got it. We got a pandemic, which leads to a crisis, which leads again to uncertainty. But happily again, there is an upside to all of this. Pandemics and crises actually have led to a lot of innovation in the past. So there you go, pandemic, crisis, uncertainty, but that leads to a lot of innovation. And 
Although I don't speak any Chinese, I'm still going to use a Chinese symbol. And that is the Chinese symbol for crisis or Wei Qi. And I'm sure I pronounced it wrong. And Wei Qi means crisis. And as you see, it exists of two symbols. The first one, Wei, means dangerous or in danger. And the second one, Qi, can mean several things. So mostly it means machine or things related to machines like planes. But among others, any of the other meanings, it can be crucial points too. Now, of course, this is a bit of a far-fetched symbolism to show the opposites of, of, of a crisis. But it's true that crisis leads to innovation. And to not stay in purely metaphors or Chinese symbols, um, I will share some actual data. So what you see here in front of you is a graph, and this is made by my former professor of economics in innovation, Alfred Kleinknecht. And he reviewed the amount of patents filed over time. So this graph goes from the 1750s to the 1980s. And although this builds on the hypothesis that, that innovation is only filing patents, which is not 100% complete, but it does give an idea of when there's more and when there's less innovation going on. So over the next 20 minutes, I will show you how historically innovation and crisis have gone hand in hand on one side. But on the other side and going forward, I will share with you how you can embrace uncertainty and crisis, not only during the crisis, but further on to drive innovation, while keeping your mental health on the good side. And we're going to focus on three key moments, a pandemic, a crisis, and a war. So starting with the Black Death, one of the worst pandemics ever, the Great Depression, one of the biggest depressions ever, and World War II, one of the biggest world, uh, world wars ever. So, of course, there were no patents in medieval times, but we're still aware that some of these changes and innovation has been going on there, although less reported. So you see in this graph that during the Great Depression, there was a huge peak. And World War II, you see that there was a big peak, but afterwards there were several more peaks, and some of them were direct results of the Second World War. So let's get started with the Black Death. So the Black Death, or the plague, swept over the UK from 1348 onwards. And by 1349, it affected the whole UK. And the results were as dramatic as you can make it. Between 40 to 60% of the whole population of the, UK, of the UK was wiped out. And this, of course, as a result, led to shortages in, for example, agricultural workers, and the immediate effect of that was a whole to the hundred years war between England and France, as there were just not enough people to fight. Now going back to the agricultural workers, you have to put yourself in the situation at the time. So you would have a landlord, and that landlord had a lot of power, and serfdom was normal. So serfdom means that you were not strictly a slave as an agricultural worker or a farmer, and you couldn't be sold, but you were bound by the land, and that could be sold. So you could be sold with the land. And on top of that, you were forced to work on that land, had to pay taxes on everything that came out of it, and you could be asked or forced to work in forest or mines at the discretion of the landlord. So as a result of the plague, and there were less people to work on the land, the peasants were in a better position and stood up for their rights in the Peasants' Revolt in 1389. So this led to more rights for them, less taxes, and as a result, a better pay. So just to review, the Black Death, less agricultural work as a changing condition in the Peasants' Revolt, and that on itself led to innovation that we had an improvement, so better payment and conditions. So dramatic event, change the situation, and improve the workers' rights. Well, let's now jump to the Great Depression. 
So the stock market crash in 1929 plummeted, especially the US and as a result, uh, other parts of the world as well, in the biggest economic crisis of the century. So one quarter of American workers were unemployed and the stories about bread lines and extreme hardship have become rather impressive and legendary. But as a result of that, and these people being out of work, quite some changes were made. And a lot of, as you already saw in the graph before, a lot of innovation happened. And one of these innovations was the tampon. And although this advertisement is from the Second World War, this was invented, the tampon was invented in, in the crisis in 1930. But during the, the, the crisis, what happened is that because men couldn't find a job, that women jumped in and took over. So the number of female workers soared 24% from 2.5 million to 13 million. And besides that, on the innovation front, um, a lot of people made their own jobs or invented new pr products just to make a living. And one of these examples is the elect electric shaver, patented in 1930. Or another one, the car radio. So we had the Great Dis Depression, there were no jobs, female workers went up to 20, went up 24%. People created their own jobs and created their own inventions. And as a result of that, we got razors, the car radio and the tampon and the company Tempex as a result. So it's not that all of that was new. It was just that it was accelerated because of a changing in conditions. Now let's jump to the Second World War. So during and after the Second World War, a lot of inventions came to market or came to the field or in the hands of people on the front line. So a lot of these inventions weren't particularly invented in the Second World War, but they already existed. It was just that the situation was there and the situation changed and there was a bit more of urgency to save people's lives that these inventions accelerated, were invested more in and came to market faster. So as an example, let's take the radar. So in 1904, a German gentleman called Christian Hülsmeier, he found a way using radar to detect ships in fog. There wasn't too much demand for that at that moment, but the invention was already started, the radar. Then in 1922, two American radio scientists, they find out the same thing but several years later, and they found out that they could detect ships as well. And uh, they took that even further because they thought, well, for a war, this would be really useful. Well, they asked the US Navy for $5,000, and they didn't get it. So um, eight years later, they were still experimenting. One of the scientists was still experimenting with the radio signals. And he tried it and what he found out that he could do the same but if he pointed it to the sky so he was able to detect planes in the sky and as you see this poor guy in the picture uh, with his big ears on that was the same effect but of course how many of these guys are you really going to have sitting at the shores of the, the coast to hear if a plane is coming and what if the plane is slightly si more silent or he flies higher up and again, it was denied. So in 1930, this was denied. Because what the military planner said is that, well, if it can't give results in like two years max, then it's just not worth their time of money, their time and money. So they said no. But then in 1941, on December 7th, you might recognize the date, the warning system was still being field tested when 353 Japanese bombers launched a surprise attack on the Pearl Harbor naval base in Hawaii. Well, you now know the outcome of that. Hundreds of planes and no, dozens of battleships and hundreds of planes were destroyed and all in all, around two and a half thousand servicemen lost their lives. 
and catapulted the US into the Second World War. Another invention was this. This was the Enigma, which was a German encryption machine, which they used in their communication between uh, everything from planes to submarines uh, to the naval bases where they were stationed. Well, you might have seen the movie The Imitation Game on Netflix. Well, what you can see there is that Alan Turing, a mathematician, and uh, another team, they were set up to try to break the code. Well, it's not that code breaking was completely new, it already existed. And on top of it, if you look at the movie, Alan Turing used a big machine where he goes through the code or through every message and tries to break the code by automating this. Well, that machine itself, he didn't invent it. They just bought it in from Poland where it already existed. So the, the mathematical background was already there, code breaking already existed and the machine already existed. But the conditions was there to solve it and to apply it onto the field with the result that it could save lots of lives. So again, you had the Second World War, there was a need to protect people right now, so an urgency. Radar and code breaking accelerated, it already existed. And as a result, the field of like advanced radar and even artificial intelligence, you could say, started at that moment. So what do all these three cases have in common? Well, simple. There are existing problems, like the peasants in, in 1348. It's not that the problem that they didn't have any rights were new. The problem that you couldn't hear planes coming and when they were attacking you was not new. Menstruation problems and how to manage that on your work were not new either. The car radio was a new. Being able to shave yourself fast was a new. So the problems already existed, but what did happen that there were changing conditions. There was a new condition, as in the case of the pheasants, that there were less people uh, or less workers. Or it might be that uh, people didn't have a job, so they were searching for a new job. But on top of it, that combination was that there were new possibilities and quite often technological possibilities, especially the later half of this century, of last century. But on top of it, there was urgency, a sense of urgency that something needs to be done now. So all these cases, you could say there was a lot of uncertainty, or at least the perception of uncertainty. You can say when the Germans are attacking the UK, there's not very much uncertainty. They are attacking the UK, and if they bombard your house, uh, they'll burn it and you die. So uncertainty is always there and has always been there. The only thing what changed it, the last one, the urgency, that the, the outcome of the possible effects of this uncertainty are really big. So that brings us to uncertainty. So uncertainty just means that there's a lack of sureness about someone or something. Or that it could range, this, this uncertainty can range from almost complete lack of conviction or knowledge, especially about an outcome or result, to close to being certain. But as before, uncertainty, so what? I mean, what does it matter if things are uncertain? Well, as human beings, we are not great in handling uncertainty at all. Actually, in the case of uncertainty, we get stressed and push ourselves to do something, like do something to lower that uncertainty. And quite often that happens, and especially when uncertainty, when you're precisely between it's going well or it's going wrong. Imagine that you are gambling and you're about to, you're winning the whole time. You feel very sure of yourself you're very certain that you're going to win. Or when you've been losing a lot of times and you kind of give up, you're very certain, so you're not very stressed. You're sad, but you're not, you're not stressed. But if you're just in the middle, that's when you get really excited. Well, this sense of having to do something leads to a lot of stress because you can't always do something right now. And this, as a result, leads a lot of people to anxiety. So 
wanting to do something but not being able to do something. And as I mentioned before, anxiety is actually on the rise with COVID-19, quite a lot. So more uncertainty and not being able to do something about it, more stress and anxiety. And just to illustrate that a little bit, I'll, I'll use an anecdote or a discussion I had with a friend of mine a few years uh, ago. And we agreed to meet in a, in a bar and uh, he came there and uh, I didn't see him for several months and he said, and he actually shaved his head and he looked surprisingly, he took a water. Normally he will always take a beer. He then told me that he recently had been diagnosed with cancer and was on chemotherapy. So quite dramatic. But then he told me how he found out that he had cancer by asking a second opinion from a family friend. Well, now what stuck with me the most was what he said as follows. Okay, the worst was the process waiting for the results from the lab to come back. I had to wait two weeks and I was so relieved when I got the results. Well, just to iterate that the results were that he, would ha that he had cancer. But then, so take that in. So uncertainty is even worse than actually having a bad outcome. But what does uncertainty really matter? I don't know what I will eat tomorrow. I don't know what my kids will study. I don't know how long I will live. Neither if I will get a terrible disease or if there will be a terrible earthquake next year. I don't know that. And that brings me back to what we do at COA Health, which is improving mental health. And I'm gonna show you one example, which is something that we use in one of our programs. And it's taken from cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is an exercise called challenge your thoughts. And what it tries to look at is what you think will happen is that really what will happen. So especially in anxiety, it's quite often that if there's uncertainty that you start to imagine the worst case scenario. So imagine that your boss is looking at you strangely. You might think that you're going to get fired. You might keep on having spiraling thoughts, which then go to, hmm, he might get fired, he might ruin my life, I might lose my house, I might lose my family, I might actually have to live under a bridge, I might die under a bridge alone. Well, that is called spiraling thought, and um, with this exercise, we try to avoid that. So you have your thought, but then you start looking, is there actually any evidence that this is true? Is there any evidence that this actually is not true? So again, we are looking here at evidence, which of all these cases that you have in your head, which is actually the more realistically? Because you can say out of uncertainty, that just means that there's gonna be a lot of scenarios in the future that might play out, but you don't know which one. And to that effect, I want to use this quote, which is from William Gibson, an American Canadian sci-fi author. So he says, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. Well, what that really means is that, as in the past, or uh, you might say like in, in the big depression, like the car radio, I'm sure there was already someone out there that had like a radio in his car. I'm sure that someone already used a tampon-like device. And I'm very sure that someone experimented with trying to automate a shaver and to uh, see if you can make an automatic shaver. And of course, more recently in the current COVID pandemic, it's not the first time and we won't be the only one that are working from home or need not be the only one where they don't really have an office. There were already several companies that didn't have an office at all. And that then leads us to, okay, if you have all these kind of different scenarios and just not evenly distributed, how going forward do we know what these scenarios are? Because again, as in the cognitive behavioral therapy exercises, if you can foresee all these kind of scenarios, that really helps out to find out if this is a realistic thought or it's not a realistic thought. And that helps us in innovation. So that gets us to the what if scenario. So to do that, we create future scenarios and make them as realistic as possible. So for example, what if 50% of farmers would pass away nowadays? Or what if half of the people won't go back to the office anymore? Well, the king and queen, in my opinion, 
of future scenarios are Charlie Brooker and Annabelle Jones, who wrote Black Mirror. So Black Mirror is the dystopian future where Charlie Brooker normally goes towards the negative side, and you could swap it around to make it a white mirror, and you're only going to look at like the really positive side. It's probably a reali reality will be somewhere in the middle. So what they actually do is that they sit down with the two of them, they start brainstorming, and they get to a what-if situation, and then they'll go ping-ponging back and forth what that actually means, and what if this happens, and what if that happens, and what if that happens. Well, in the past few years, we've worked together with the Royal College of Art and we set up together with them a unit called Exploratory, where we start looking at future scenarios. And precisely that's what we did. We went for a scenario like, what if? For example, what if we live longer? What if we can get kids when we're 70? What if? you don't have to stop your career because you want to have kids. What if you can do that when you're actually retired? Or what if we can have kids via artificial wombs? Can you just order one online with, you know, you can say when, how old you are, what you really want to do. And these are scenarios which we're just extrapolating what's happening right now and just taking them to the future. So we say, what if what's happening now actually does work out? Or another one which is already ongoing. What if trust in religious institutions actually diminishes? What if we're fed up of imams and priests? What happens? Can we just automate religion? So get the parts out of it that we want and take out the middleman? Can we have a pocket Jesus where we ask Jesus the things and get connected to other people? So what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And this leads us to a lot of different scenarios. So as before, I can go to the dark part and say like, well, what if, and you always end up with, you're going to die, or the world is going to fall apart, or you go to the what if, which is extremely positive and everyone live, will live in harmony ever after. But which are the really realistic routes? Well, what you see here is a decision tree. So a decision tree is quite often used to look what is the most probable outcome. So you already start to see the parallel. Okay, that's a future scenario. So what if there's no vaccine available in the next 10 years? What if the hospitals will get over, over flooded, uh, as the case now? What if then? And you just start going through all these scenarios and then you can actually start calculating which are the ones which are most likely. And the good thing about having that is that not only it helps you to foresee a little bit what the scenarios are for the future, but you can start innovating based on these future use cases or these future scenarios. Well, I want to suggest one thing. I want to suggest that instead of that we say uncertainty, because nothing is 100% certain, I would coin the phrase some certainty. Because there always will be some certainty, which then means some doubt, some duty, some skepticism, some suspicions. There's always some level of sureness about someone or something. And it might always have some lack of conviction or knowledge, especially about an outcome of a result. It always will be there. So what I would like to leave you with for today is that I would say, use certainty. Let's say we'll manage some certainty we design for changing realities and we innovate on top of that while keeping our mental health in a good shape. Thanks very well and any questions, please feel free.